expectations are tricky things. Um, hype is a tricky thing, you know? People freak out about stuff, and we live in a, in a time, uh, in a day and age, where the common dialect is very much rooted in superlatives, you know? You notice that everything around is sort of described as being uh, either the greatest or the worst fucking thing. So, uh, in order to cope with this, because, you know, people are freaking out about stuff all the time. Um, in order to cope with this, I have kind of adjusted my approach to movies because movies are, are arguably the most popular art form we all engage in, um, and they're the most sort of subject to the effects of hype and expectation. So when going into most movies, I try to manage my expectations. I try not to watch too much stuff, you know, too many trailers, too many this or that, because, you know, I want to enjoy going to the movies, and I want to be as fresh as possible, you know? I don't want to paint too much of a picture for myself before I go in, so I try to keep things managed. I try to not let myself get too extraordinarily excited for things, um, which is kind of a bummer, you know, because well, you want to be excited about everything, but, you know, in the current day and age we live in, there's so much stuff around, it's hard to get excited about everything, and it's hard to, you know, yeah. So, there are two movies I can think of in recent memory uh, that I personally allowed myself to get excited for as much as I damn well pleased. There are two movies that I didn't try to manage or hamper any of my expectations, bring them closer to Earth. Um, one was World's End, the Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, uh, Edgar Wright film a couple years ago. I decided I'm going to take that one because I trust those guys. I'm going to allow myself to be just as excited as I wanted to be. And it was great. Like, I love that movie. I had a great time. It satisfied my expectations. And that was such a joy because a lot of times now, it's hard to do that. And the second movie I can think of where I allowed myself to get as excited as I just naturally wanted to be was this movie. It was Mad Max Fury Road. I've seen the first two films. I admit I haven't seen Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome yet. I will see it. But I like the Mad Max world, I like Mad Max a lot, and I saw the trailer for this and I was like, holy shit, this could be the one, this could be something special. And I allowed myself to get excited for this movie. And... I'm just so, I'm just so happy. Um, <laughs> you know, man, I don't know quite where to begin, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this now. I think... The rest of Hollywood, you know, the rest of the people making these big, expensive, noisy action movies ought to sit down and take a couple pointers from George Miller and company because Mad Max Fury Road, at least as of right now, I, oh my goodness, I haven't uh, had this experience in a movie in a long, long time. There were five applause breaks. Um, you know, what to say about this movie? I mean, you can already probably tell how I'm feeling. This movie is, like the other Mad Max movies, a force of nature, you know? It's a force of nature and, and metal. And, you know, those movies arguably vary, but, you know, the first one is good. And the second one, I, I love Road Warrior. Let's let's just get into this right now. Um, ah! Oh, man, this movie. Uh, I'm a little lost for words. This... This movie is, 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 is kind of a symphony, in a way, and, and it really is, because it has these movements and it has these, these passages. Um, it is sort of a symphony of, of destruction and fire and heat and sand and metal and hope and lack of hope and violent. Like, it is kind of beautiful in a really harsh way. Um, it's a force of nature, and so few movies are now. So few movies are allowed to be that. Um, and I, I so appreciate this. I haven't uh, been this enthralled by an action movie um, in a long time. I haven't felt this way after an action movie in a long time. I went with some friends. They graciously bought me a ticket in return for a favor, and, and we went, you know, with all the bells and whistles. And after the movie, 
we just sort of sat there. Like, the theater was clearing out, and we were just sitting there, just kind of piecing our brains back together. Because this movie is, is a force of nature, and, and so few movies nowadays are, and I, that's off the bat, that is something I so admire. Um, because you don't see stuff like this a lot. This This is something special. Even if you don't like it, I would argue, this is something that is special, and it does carry on the spirit of the original Mad Max films, and it adds to it, and it even brings a certain progressive quality to it. It's not in your face, necessarily. It's not like, look, the message, but in a way that's almost even more powerful. You have this, this very real but very simple struggle. You know, you start in this futuristic, nihilistic, just nasty, dystopian future. These people are basically worshipping this this guy, Immortan Joe, who lives in this big rock tower and he is the only one with access to water. Because water, things like water and gasoline and, and even just anything green are woefully scarce in this version of the world. And so we start out on Max, Max Rokotansky, uh, and he's alone. You know, but not for long, because things kick off pretty much right away. He's being pursued by these, you know, insane futuristic dudes, and he's on the run. And, and pretty quick, they catch him. And then the main action that sort of kicks off the main plot of the film comes when, on a sort of routine gasoline and, and bullet run, Imperator Furiosa, Charlize Theron, uh, takes a bit of a detour. She's got a different plan, and that's sort of where things kick off. Chaos and, and mayhem ensue. And this movie, you know, we get a lot of spectacle now, you know? Spectacle isn't that special anymore because spectacle is everywhere. Like, look at this summer. Summer 2015 is chocker -bock full of big, loud, effects-driven extravaganzas. And this is a big, loud extravaganza, but there's a fundamental approach this movie takes to that that I think separates it from a lot of other movies coming out right now. The approach that this movie takes just to its action, because action is its language, you know, the language of these movies is destruction and gasoline and revving engines and stuff like that. And just to know that a lot of this stuff is there somehow, you know, and then aided by CG when it needs to be, makes it all the more visceral and it gives it that much more of a punch. It makes it that much more palpable. And that's how I think, and a lot of people think, you know, uh, you should approach effects now is sort of what can we do in camera, let's do that. And then what can't we do in camera, then we'll bring in CG. Marry CGI and practical effects together, and you get something like this. It's hard to direct good action, you know, we get a lot of action, some of it's better than others, and this is top notch, man. The action is, is spectacular in, but, but for real. <laughs> it's a lean story. You know, it's, it's, it's a relatively simple story, but it's told in such a way where, you, and even if you haven't seen the other films, you can get what kind of world you're in, what the details of this world are, because there is so much on screen. You know, there's a lot of visual storytelling and stuff like that. The plot of this movie is pretty simple. It's a chase movie, you know, it's very immediate. Things happen, things go wrong. There are a lot of forces at odds, and that's where a lot of the main action comes from, you know, and it's, it is simple and it is straightforward in that way. And the dialogue is very sparing, but it does that really well. You know, it's like events unfold and they all kind of abide by the rules of this world. There isn't a whole lot of like, well, that was convenient, you know, and every victory Victory, vic, 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 victory. No victory comes without a very difficult fight. You know, every victory this movie gets, and, and every tragedy as well, has an impact, and, and you feel the cost of it all, and you feel the weight of it all. You're compelled by the action because it's just so huge and it's overwhelming almost, and it's, to use the word for its actual purpose, it's awesome. With the approach and care that comes with, you know, choreographing these chases and these acrobatic sequences and really making, you know, action not just cool, but beautiful and creative and hypnotic. You know, like they really put these things on screen. Your jaw's on the floor a little bit, or at least mine was. And then when there are moments in between where people were talking or figuring out the next move, you listen up because there aren't a lot of words to pick from, you know, and I think, that this movie establishes a really cool contrast that way. The performance is really good too, you know, Charlize Theron and, and Tom Hardy, Nicholas Holt, everyone, you know, just feels like they're living in and are from this world. And you know, Max spends so much time in this movie as he has in the other movies, being, you don't 
get to know a lot about Max, you know? He's not inclined to tell anybody about himself, you know? He's, this is a world in which you don't make a lot of connections, but it still works. You can still see the history in his face and in Charlize Theron's face and in everyone, like everyone in this movie does a really good job. And this is a movie, you know, whose story is all kind of told in the action, not necessarily even set pieces and whatnot, but you know, this is a world that isn't very diplomatic. It's not a world where people talk a whole lot, you know, it's just the necessity for speech. This isn't a civilized society they're living in. So, so much of the, you know, stuff that happens in this movie is visual and immediate. Um, but the actors all do a really good job, you know, sort of inhabiting this world. And the world itself, I mean, just the designs of everything and, you know, just this vision, you know, I really appreciate what George Miller is doing here. I mean, George Miller created this, you know, back at the end of the 70s, He's in the 70s and the 80s too, to a, to a different degree. The 70s was a time where like movies did still have this sort of anything could happen force of nature quality and this really brings that spirit back full throttle pardon the pun <laughs> this is one of those movies where for me all the technical stuff kind of comes together to make a, a really cohesive whole all the performances are on point you really believe you know these people inhabit this harsh version of the world um, and you know the direction is strong and confident I mean George Miller has been doing this for a very long time and it shows man I mean every article feels the need to point out just how 70 George Miller is you know sometimes older directors you know you lose your touch but this guy doesn't seem like he's lost anything I mean it's a very confidently directed movie it's a confidently paced movie the cinematography is incredible and I know they made a conscious decision with the colors in this film because so many of the sort of post-apocalyptic landscapes we get now are all washed out or desaturated and they wanted to play with colors in this and you get very distinct colors you know um, there's a lot of this movie is really red and orange and stuff like that and during the nighttime shots you know they went with day for night to create this really blue, this rich blue tone for the nighttime scenes. And any flash of green, you know, all the colors really pop in this movie and they make everything seem in a way, you know, even more hot and desolate and and oppressive, you know. It's like there's so much color that it almost feels like it's swallowing you up. It almost makes all that heat and dust you know, palpable. And the music, you know, Junkie XL did a lot of the music for this and the score ties in really great and the score is really diverse because there's some stuff that's electronic, you know, some stuff that is really intense and droning and deep and there's some stuff that, that you know, harkens to classical music, you know, that, that is very expressive and not Mickey Mousey but like, you know, expressive with, you know, movements and, and you know, natural instruments and even some like choral stuff and it really complements everything really well, you know, so it's like when you get everything together, when you get this immediate story and these actors, you know, you get George Miller's vision along with the Peyton, like the editing and the cinematography and just the visual look, the designs, you know, the details of the world, the music, um, you know, and you know, combine all that with the action and and the acrobatics and all this crazy stuff. I mean, it is really spectacular to behold, and we don't get movies like this anymore very often now. They're sort of populated by these really strange characters where you feel like just about anything can happen. You know, it's a harsh, nihilistic world, but you see where it came from. You know, it's like men are reduced to their basest instincts, and that's where the more feminist undertones of this movie get really cool because you know Imperator Furiosa and her team like they're they're looking for something different you know and I'm not gonna spoil anything but there 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 is something different you know to be had and, and that's just cool and it all makes sense because you know a lot of people are also freaking out about the feminist aspect of this movie and they shouldn't be because a I mean equality is good and B the things that do embody the feminist undertones in this movie it's like part of what makes those all the better and all the more powerful and, and really applause worthy are the fact that the movie itself doesn't call attention to them and be like, look what we're doing. It's an important thing, but the movie just incorporates it into its story. It's just how it's going. That's just the fight. It's just people and, and what they're fighting for, you know, and, and, you know, the stakes that they all have to come to grips with, not whether a man or a woman is doing certain things. It just so happens that there is a strong female presence in the movie and there is sort of a subtle contrast between the prominent female characters that show up in this movie and the roided out, juiced up, 
gearhead, you know, savage war clan that's coming after them. And it seems just like a movie that was made with a lot of thought and a lot of care. And that is so precious now. It seems like they waited to the right time and they had the right people, the right approach, the right idea. And this movie, to me, deserves every ounce of praise it gets. I, I wanted to see it again immediately. I can't wait till the next time I get to watch this movie. Um, I really liked it, and my hat's off to them, to, to George Miller and everybody who was involved, you know. Um, if you're looking for nitpicks, the ADR could have been better, but really, in an environment like that, when you're shooting out in, you know, the desert, I gotta imagine getting good set sound is really hard, so. Mad Max Fury Road, man, I can't recommend this movie enough, and I really hope everybody enjoys it. I'm not trying to be like, oh my god, but I am being like, oh my god. <laughs> but, you know, I am so enthralled. I'm so happy because this is just a breath of fresh air in terms of the approach. You know, George Miller owns the rights to this, and it seems like that's a good thing because they made a bunch of really wise decisions, and this movie stands apart from a lot of the things we get nowadays. Um, so I'm feeling... <laughs> As if you couldn't tell, I'm feeling very <laughs> positive on this. Um, get to the theater, you know, support this. I, I think this is a movie worth supporting. So, um, yeah, man, everything about this, I, I, I really dug. I, I was so pleased. You know, like I said, there were five, five applause breaks during this in the, in the screening I saw. That's how you do it, man. <laughs> and that's, that's how you do a crazy apocalypse movie and I'm just so happy that a movie could make me feel like this again now, you know? And so hats off to everybody involved, to George Miller, to the cast, to the crew, you know, everybody involved in making this movie. It's, it's, it's a real treat and um, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm just really happy they pulled it off, man, because for me, they pulled it off with flying colors. A plus thumb up, whatever you want to give it, but get thee to the theater and see Mad Max Fury Road. Pay for it, see it on the biggest screen you can. I imagine your head might explode, but see it in 3D if you have to, but get thee to this movie because it really is something special, especially now, and it was a nice reminder of what action cinema can be. I loved it. I loved it, so, you know. Forgive me for feeding the hype machine, but it didn't fuck it up for me, so hopefully it won't fuck it up for you. Uh, so yeah, Mad Max Fury Road is the film. Uh, Jerry is my name. Let's talk about this. Um, what would you guys like to see more of or, or see a return to or just see in general, you know, for action cinema or for, you know, post-apocalyptic cinema? You know, what's something you'd like to see maybe return to form or just in general? Let's talk about that. Anyhow, uh, Mad Max Fury Road is the film. I am Jerry. Cheers. Oof.